is perhaps a strong enough possibility to bet my life on something? What if I'm wrong? But what if I'm right? I'm Andrew Pettiprin, Fellow of Popular Culture at the Word on Fire Institute. In 1968, Father Joseph Ratzinger, the future Pope Benedict XVI, wrote one of his greatest works, Introduction to Christianity. In it, he responds to the ascendant philosophical tradition in the West that had declared that there was no God and life was ultimately meaningless. In Introduction to Christianity, Ratzinger turns modern doubts upside down. Ratzinger paints a big picture of a Christian faith that does not seek to be the biggest and best option among many religions. Rather, Christianity is reality, the true, the great something that forms the basis of that strong perhaps that asks probing questions back to the philosophy of nothingness. Ratzinger goes so far as to say that in the end, there is a certain unrejectability about belief. Our experiences in the world simply will not let us really believe that there is no God. He says, there is no escape from the dilemma of being a man. Anyone who makes up his mind to evade the uncertainty of belief will have to experience the uncertainty of unbelief, which can never finally eliminate for certain the possibility that belief may, after all, be the truth. Many of the great films in the history of cinema explore this wonderful and dangerous ground of uncertainty. In some cases, these films may be able to serve as a final push off the tiny footbridge of atheism or agnosticism and right into the safety net of faith. We now explore two such films, Hannah and Her Sisters by Woody Allen and The Big Lebowski by Joel and Ethan Coen. Many of the themes of Woody Allen's movies are undergirded by existentialist philosophy. Even in zany comedies, Allen's films have a way of forcing us to think about our mortality and the reason for being alive. His 1986 classic, Hannah and Her Sisters, is one of his finest specimens. Every character in the film is plagued by a perhaps, starting with Woody's character, Mickey Sachs. Mickey is a hypochondriac, whose constant perhaps is that no matter how well he feels or how successful his career is, it could all come crumbling down in an instant. He experiences significant hearing loss, and for the first time in his life, his worries have his doctors worried too. Mickey fears the worst, a brain tumor, and he confides in his secretary, I was happy, but I just didn't realize I was happy. Mickey was so obsessed with a negative perhaps that he failed to see the goodness around him. Before we find out Mickey's diagnosis, we go back in his timeline a bit to find out one thing about him that was, he thinks, actually wrong with him physically. As the husband of Hannah, the film's namesake, played by Mia Farrow, Mickey learns he is infertile. Hannah and Mickey are told it's a cold, hard fact. No perhaps about it. Hannah and Mickey pursue an extreme scientific solution so that they can have a family, a plan that involves Mickey's close friend and business partner, and the marriage is destroyed. Years later, Mickey sits pensively, waiting to hear if something much worse than infertility looms ahead of him. He says to himself as he awaits the doctor's word, It's over. I'm face to face with eternity. The best case scenario brings on a full-blown crisis for Mickey. He doesn't have cancer. There's absolutely nothing wrong with him. But suddenly, his eventual death starts to haunt him. Mickey quits his lucrative but stressful television job and goes on a deep search for meaning, including a near conversion to Catholicism that would have broken his Jewish parents' heart. Many of the other characters in Hannah and her sisters are perplexed by perhaps as well. Untethered from God, the ground of being, there is no joy only fleeting moments of happiness, followed by prolonged sadness. Elliot, played by Michael Caine, is a rich businessman who has married Hannah after her divorce from Mickey. He has everything that looks like success, 
but nothing makes ultimate sense. He cheats on his wife with her sister, Lee, played by Barbara Hershey. For a moment, Elliot allows his fantasy to play out, but he quickly discovers that it provides only a false sense of fulfillment. This, perhaps, proves completely empty. Elliot returns from a dalliance with Lee, declaring, it was like living out a dream. But he then elaborates on the stable family life he has returned to. There's something lovely and real about Hannah. She gives me a deep feeling of being part of something. Like Mickey, Elliot experiences an identity crisis. The perhaps created by his own foolish mistakes start to crush him. He suddenly says to himself, for all my education, accomplishments, and so-called wisdom, I can't fathom my own heart. Perhaps when one tries to create his own moral universe, he realizes that he would really never want to live in it. On the opposite end of the spectrum from Elliot is Frederick, Lee's longtime live-in boyfriend. He is principled above all, a misanthropic artist played by the great Max von Sydow. He is a man who conveys no sense of perhaps, for better or for worse. Lee pleads with him, could you please lighten up? Among the sisters mentioned in the film's title, Holly is the youngest. Hannah, the oldest, seems to possess infinite talent. The middle, Lee, is a great beauty. For Holly, everything in life is a perhaps. She lives in the shadow of others and everything she does is a success or failure measured against them. She struggles with drugs and unemployment. She wants to be an actress. She wants to meet a handsome man. She sabotages herself with a constant inner monologue of negativity. Perhaps, Holly tells herself, she's simply not good enough for anything. In the end, however, Holly's perhaps and Mickey's perhaps converge in an unexpected and life-affirming conclusion to the film. Perhaps the universe does have meaning. Perhaps the negative stories you repeat to yourself in your head simply aren't true. In the closing scenes of Hannah and her sisters, Mickey tells Holly how it took almost killing himself to come to his senses. He says, what if the worst is true? Don't you want to be part of the experience? He says, Maybe there is something. Nobody really knows. Maybe is a very slim read to hang your whole life on, but that's all we have. In the aftermath of his epiphany, Mickey falls in love with and marries Holly, who has written a wonderful play and is finally standing on her own two feet. Lucky I ran into you, she says. In the last shot of the film, Holly tells Mickey she is pregnant with his child. Maybe turns out to be more than enough. When you can at least posit a maybe, a perhaps, you begin to experience the miraculous. Joel and Ethan Cohen's 1998 cult classic, The Big Lebowski, is premised on one big misunderstanding. A perhaps proves completely groundless, but it opens the door to an examination of the meaning of life itself. The misunderstanding consists in the identity of the dude, Jeffrey Lebowski, who has the same name as a supposed big shot Los Angeles businessman. The dude, played by Jeff Bridges in perhaps his most famous role, seems on the surface like an insignificant person, a nobody, a loser. The dude is lazy. He has no job. He smokes a lot of pot and drinks a lot of white Russians. He has a crummy apartment and a jalopy of a car. And he bowls a lot. Bowling, in fact, is an important motif throughout the film. It is a simple but profound way to belong for a person to have meaning beyond himself. It is no accident that one of the most popular books about the loneliness and meaninglessness of modern Western society is called Bowling Alone, the bestseller from the year 2000 by Robert D. Putnam of Harvard University. The dude bowls and does most everything else with his friends. Walter, 
an intense Vietnam veteran played by John Goodman, and Donnie, an awkward motormouth played by Steve Buscemi. The dude is their common bond, the head of a little social body centered around a Southern California bowling alley. Even the dude's landlord, to whom he is in arrears on rent, depends on the dude for his encouragement with his theatrical endeavors and his presence at the premiere of his avant-garde play. One day, the dude's life is turned upside down. A couple of tough guys break into his apartment, stick his head in the toilet, and urinate on his rug, a rug that really ties the room together. They want Lebowski's money, money that the woman they presume to be his wife, a woman named Bunny, owes to people all over town. The dude points to his squalid surroundings, asking, does it look like I'm married, man? Perhaps the bad guys have made a mistake. The dude then goes on a simple quest for retribution for his ruined rug. He meets the real Big Lebowski, the real husband of Bunny, the rich guy who seems to have it all apart from the use of his legs, which were permanently disabled in honorable military service. But perhaps the Big Lebowski's image is all phony. The ball quickly starts rolling on this question. A series of plot developments unfold, and it doesn't much matter to the dude, nor to the audience, what the real story is. What matters are the people, their dilemmas, and what they have to lose and gain. Bunny Lebowski is supposedly kidnapped by nihilists, people who ostensibly believe in nothing, and therefore have no room in their self-sure brains for any perhaps. And yet, the nihilists are clowns. When the dude first sees Uli, the leader of this group, Uli is passed out drunk in the pool at the Big Lebowski's mansion. Bunny tells him, Uli doesn't care about anything. He's a nihilist. The dude replies, inadvertently hitting the nail right on the head. Ah, that must be exhausting. To stay away from any perhaps, to walk that tightrope over truth and never fall in, takes a whole lot of negative willpower. In one scene, the dude, Donnie, and Walter contemplate the nihilists at the bowling alley bar. Walter exposes the lie of their ideology with an extreme counterexample, declaring, Say what you will about the tenets of National Socialism, dude, at least it's an ethos. Indeed, the 20th century theologian Paul Tillich once noted that the tragedy of Nazi Germany was ultimately spiritual. Looking back on World War II, he said, One could observe how the European youth desired to be initiated into symbols which demanded unconditional surrender, even if they showed very soon their demonic, destructive character. They wanted something for which they could sacrifice themselves, even if it was a distorted religious political aim. Walter, incidentally, is the movie's man of faith. He is reckless, governed by righteous indignation gone awry, and likely influenced by post-traumatic stress from the Vietnam War. But he is a believer. He was raised Polish Catholic, but converted to Judaism when he got married. And although he and his wife are no longer together, he still keeps a strict Sabbath observance. He is a wild man, but a man of principle. To the world, he seems like the crazy one. But to him, the world untethered from the law of God, has thoroughly lost its way. Eventually, we learn that Bunny Lebowski hasn't been kidnapped, and the nihilists have been used and discarded by the Big Lebowski, the same thing he tried to do to the dude. When the nihilists come for the dude and Walter demanding money, Walter exposes their nothingness for the pretense that it always is. Donnie asks worryingly, Are they going to hurt us, Walter? Walter replies, No, Donnie, these men are cowards. And then Walter unleashes what some would call Old Testament physical retribution on them. The dude's quest for justice for his humble abode, a replacement rug, finally unveils the false narrative of the Big Lebowski's life. The dude meets Maud, the Big Lebowski's eccentric artist daughter, who explains everything. 
The Big Lebowski has no money of his own, and Maud is increasingly worried that he will destroy everything her mother's family has built and to which she is the rightful heiress. Perhaps there is a way to set things right. Maud decides to trick the dude into making her pregnant, an unconventional if not unwholesome act of physical intimacy. And yet, as in the miraculous pregnancy that occurs at the end of Hannah and her sisters, the future baby of Jeff the dude Lebowski and Maud Lebowski represents the triumph of meaning over meaninglessness. Life defeats death. The loser is the winner. An important something emerges out of a chaotic nothing. The dude, not the rich guy with the same name, turns out to be the big Lebowski. At the end of the film, the nameless stranger played by Sam Elliott sums up the story in his easy western drawl. The dude abides. I don't know about you, but I take comfort in that. It's good knowing he's out there, the dude, taking her easy for all us sinners. Christians, people of other faiths, and non-believers alike constantly face the same question. What if you're wrong? It's a fair question. In fact, it's an important question. Christians need never act as if it is beneath them to answer it, nor are they being unfaithful to reply, perhaps I am. Even in Jesus' innermost circle, they wondered whether they could trust what they had seen and heard. In Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus appears to his disciples in his resurrected body, we're told, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And of course, there's doubting Thomas, who in John's Gospel declares, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Jesus understands Thomas's doubt, allowing him to touch his hands inside. Our doubts are not absurd, and they may at times form a bridge to walk across to people who do not think of themselves as religious, let alone Christians or Catholics. But the word perhaps runs in the other direction too, in the direction of faith. Jesus concludes his teaching moment with St. Thomas with these words, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. What if we're not wrong? What if the promises of Christ are true? What if our lives were made for communion with God and everything else we use to try and fill the void in our souls is getting in the way of him who alone satisfies? Perhaps it's worth pondering.